Welcome, everybody. It is Tuesday, September 1st, and this is the afternoon meeting for the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee of the Vermont State House. Um, we have with us today several witnesses who are going to do follow up testimony on S237, which is a bill that we've been working on concerning um, housing, uh, the, trying to f fix some zoning issues so that we can create more affordable housing. Um, we took testimony last week. We'll continue to take testimony this week. Um, and today we have three witnesses with us. We have Jennifer Holler from VHCB, Maura Collins from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and Sue Fillion from Rattleboro. Um, and she'll give her title later. We're gonna start today with Jen, um, holler now jen as you know we've received and this is for all our witnesses as you know we've received this bill from the senate um it was originally part of a larger bill that it was proposing to make many more changes to act 250 and so that had been separated in the senate and we ended up with this portion of it in our committee and to be honest we weren't expecting it um, so there is information that we're still learning. Um, we're hearing, um, we heard some concerns about elements of the bill last week from, uh, from the Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns and from a town planner up in St. Albans. Um, we will hear more. We've received a lot of information. And so if people are interested in sharing their thoughts, Thoughts. Again, we have a shortage of time to hear all the witnesses who want to be heard. Um, but if there are people who do want to be heard, um, that many people have shared their written thoughts. And if people have written thoughts that they can't want to share with us, and any of the testimony that you, anybody here today is prepared electronically, if you want that shared on our website, we're collecting written testimony. And um, while we do have a limitation on time, given the month that we're working in, which is now down to 24 days, uh, including today, um, we will, we're learning about this bill every day and we're learning about the concerns. And so um, today's testimony is just more for us to hear the point of view from other facets of the stakeholders who have participated in this conversation over the last year or so. So with that, um, I'd just like to go ahead and um, start the day with Jen Holler. Um, Jen, the microphone is yours. Okay, well, speaking of that, can you hear me all right? I've been having a little bit of mic trouble. You're good? Okay. You're awesome. okay, yeah. Okay, so I know your time is short and I am not an expert on a lot of the provisions in the bill. So what I um, hope to do is just to speak very generally to how it came together and um, why VHCB thinks um, it's important and we're um, hoping you are finding a way, you do find a way to, uh, to help it, um, it move forward. So um, thank you for the time today. Um, you know, S-237 was really intended by your um, Senate counterparts as a comprehensive approach. And it, you might recall that it came out of a summer, they, after the summer they spent traveling around the state at a series of regional meetings um, hearing from all kinds of folks. And um, uh, the bill is really meant to pull together a series of different tools, actually all the tools that are available to state government to address barriers to housing development. So as you guys know well, there's really just four things um, the state can do to affect the kind of change that it wants to see. It can tax, it can spend, it can regulate, and it can educate. Um, and the original version of, of S-237 included all of those things, an expansion of downtown tax credits, um, funding for housing programs and services, um, regulatory changes to Act 250 and zoning requirements, um, as well as a number of different studies that are meant to um, inform and educate. So some of those pieces have fallen away as the bill went along its path, um, some just in recognition of the with the current budget situation and um, some of the Act 250 pieces were pulled out and um, combined with the rest of the Act 250 legislation that's moving um, separately through the Senate now. Um, but there are a lot of really uh, meaningful and important sections that remain um, and we support the bill as it's currently, um, as it's currently drafted. Um, and so I should, um, I should 
recognize, and I really um, want to emphasize this, that I, I know that Section 2B, the, um, the pieces sort of known as the inclusive um, housing provisions, um, have been, um, are quite controversial. I, um, I um, know that people are very, uh, divided on that, even um, within the municipal sector, I mean, even within the planning community, um, and you know, even the various regional planning commissions all can have a slightly different take. And I think it's because it can really impact different communities very, uh, very differently. I know that you've gotten proposals from the Vermont Planning Association and then um, also from you know, um, the Lamoille um, County Regional Planning Commission. And those may very well be good and important improvements to the bill. Um, so I guess I would just urge you to, um, to look through those and find ways to um, improve and strengthen Section 2B rather than doing away with it um, altogether. Um, there's one other section of the bill that I wanted to call out specifically because I don't know if others will speak to it and um, we think it's important and that has to do with the direction to the Department of Environmental Conservation um, to work with their um, revolving loan fund program um, as it um, pertains to some loans that are um, held by the Pride Park Mobile Home Park um, in Brattleboro. Um, and you'll hear from Sue Lillian uh, a little bit later, but um, we, VHCB and others for many years have been trying to um, support what Tri Park Mobile Home Park have been hoping to do. You may recall, and I believe you had some witnesses in earlier um, in the year. Um, it's a resident-owned cooperative. It was impacted severely by Tropical Storm Irene. They have a number of um, homes that are still in danger and in the floodway, and they have been undergoing a master planning process to identify ways in which they can move those homes um, over time, address some infrastructure issues, um, and um, take a comprehensive approach to some work that needs to happen there. Um, it's not a simple situation and it's not, it's not gonna be inexpensive to address it. Um, part of their financial package are some um, loans um, to the uh, DEC's revolving loan fund programs um, that I think it would really help the park if they were able to um, renegotiate those or even have some pieces forgiven. So um, the Senate decided to include some language asking DEC work with Pride Park in that direction. And um, we hope that that, we, we feel like that's a, um, um, that would be an important conversation to have and uh, support that section of the bill and hope that can remain as well. So when I testified, um, oh, let's see, I actually just also wanted to mention that I think um, uh, when, uh, VA, when the legislature provided funding uh, to VHCB with the housing revenue bond um, to, um, do housing all around the state. We really thought about ways in addition to the funding um, that we could try to support um, other policy approaches to providing for more, ho more housing, you know, efforts that would last and be even more expansive than the actual housing units that were cre created by that resource. So one of the things we did was to um, help the Department of Housing and Community Development um, with their, uh, what was started as a model bylaw project to give municipalities tools and examples, examples um, and ways to update their zoning so that it might um, allow for more housing if that's what they wanted to do. And that became the zoning for great neighborhoods. And I think we've had some testimony on that before, but um, this is the, the product of that work. And I think it's been pretty well received and seen by municipalities as a helpful tool. So I wanted to um, congratulate the department on their work there and also say that that is out there and I think municipalities are taking that to heart and using it um, um, using it to think about what's the, the biggest, as, as you may have heard, the biggest little change they can make in order to um, move, um, move their communities in the direction they wanna go. And so I also, you might recall when I testified last week that at the, at the very end, I showed a, a photo of a, um, uh, a family moving into a habitat for humanity home in Rutland that VHCB had, had supported and that family was relocating from Syria. And, and I made the point then that providing, making more housing available 
and increasing affordability is one of the very best ways in which we can make our communities more inclusive and welcoming um, to people of all, um, you know, from all over the world, of all races, of all origins, and all orientations. Um, I've seen how that's played out in my own community over the last uh, 20 or 30 years where um, I've seen new Americans from uh, from Europe, from Central America, and from Africa find their first American homes in the rental properties um, that Downstreet Housing and Community Development owns and operates. And some of those families um, are still, um, still in those homes, um, and others have moved on either to buy a shared equity home or to um, enter into the uh, more traditional housing, housing market. And um, just as another reference point, we know that um, the Champlain Housing Trust, all of their residents, 25% of them are people of color. So I think at this time, um, a sort of renewed and um, overdue uh, focus on some of, the, of our governmental and societal systems and the way in, in which they impact opportunities for people or, or they may limit opportunities for people. I think it's, um, uh, important for us to look at housing policy and zoning through that lens um, and to be willing to take a hard look at complicated issues and to be willing to make some um, some hard decisions around that if that's if that's what it takes to update them in the ways that um, in the ways that um, that are going to be helpful to us and to the people that we want to welcome to our communities so I think I will just leave it there um, and take any questions and hand you off to some experts. Okay, thank you. I have a question, um, but I'll go to Representative Zott first. Yeah, thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts. I, um, I guess I'm a little confused. Like when I think about, I mean, it's, it's not easy for me to follow how this bill actually meets all the very laudable goals that you cited for affordable housing. Like, um, I get how if uh, a VHCB got its full share of its statutorily mandated funding, how that would increase affordable housing in the state. I get if uh, the state of Vermont said, we're gonna allocate money for wastewater for small towns, so that which is one of the biggest obstacles for development is the access to uh, waste or adequate wastewater. I get that. But when I see state mandated lot sizes, uh, and when I've heard testimony about density versus lot size, I don't see how state mandated lot sizes, for instance, uh, gets us towards more affordable housing. Or, or should I, or I should say, how it is the best or most appropriate vehicle to get us there when we have other options that we could be pursuing, but we're we're going down this road for some reason. And maybe you could help me figure that one out. Well, so sure. So that's um that um is a really important question. And uh, I think that it's one I'm unfortunately not gonna be able to answer with any certainty. So whether or not thinking about density or provisions around that or minimum lot sizes are the best way to go, I'm afraid that, that I am uh, just um, don't have the background or VHCB doesn't have the purview to speak to that. What we can say, I guess the perspective I would offer is that we know that um, around the state in areas that it can be difficult to find places where the land is affordable and where um, people have access to services and transportation, water and sewer. And, may, and it probably makes sense to allow as much reasonably um, housing in those areas um, as possible. And so is there a way in which there are some unintended consequences of um, zoning that's in place right now that could, uh, with a change, allow for allow for more housing in certain areas, and that would. Um, I guess I can share that in my own community, and this is probably this is um, that I have seen in my own community. I saw that there was an attempt, and actually, um, the, the folks worked to update our zoning years and years and years of work, but there were places in which the planning commission um, recommended. And uh, ultimately, the city council considered zoning changes that would have allowed development that 
basically matches the traditional development pattern in neighborhoods in some places. And then in other places where there are very large lot sizes that would have allowed it, uh, um, you know, one to four units on those lots. And um, it, some of those folks in those areas really didn't want their neighborhoods to change. And they were concerned that because zoning would technically allow X number of units that all of a sudden those number of units were gonna pop up in their community. And um, ultimately um, the will wasn't there to override those, um, those community concerns. And I think that in some instances, if there's a change at the state level, and my understanding is that municipalities can opt out of this if, if, they, um, if they feel like they're constrained in any number, in any number of ways. Um, if there's a, a reference point at the state level that can make it an easier conversation at the local level when there's when there are some concerns. Now, what's really difficult about this is it's very different for different kinds of communities, and I can appreciate that that's a that that's a, a a challenging piece to this. And so, again, I really want to emphasize that I can't, I don't, I think the idea of some zone two um, B is good generally, but I think that you've gotten some good improvements um, offered. Um, by a number of other witnesses and entities, and, and I, I, I hope that you'll consider those. And do you, do you live in Montpelier? Is that your? I, yeah, I do. So I, yes. I assume you saw the testimony from uh, Mike Miller submitted today. No, I heard I heard Karen Karen Horn's um, uh, testimony last week, but I haven't seen Mike's now. Well, Mike, I think, gives a somewhat different uh, summation of the planning and development landscape in Montpelier and had a much less um, enthusiastic or neutral um, response to this, this bill. Um, and I guess, again, like I, I, I totally, I'm sort of maybe beating a dead horse here, but I really, as you just sort of ended, uh, you, you talked about how there's different solutions for different parts of the state. Um, but I don't know that different solutions for different parts of the state applies to say, hey, the legislature is going to allocate a fund for funding wastewater so that we can have more dense development in some of our rural communities. Like that's super clear that that is a way to achieve affordable housing. And I just don't I just don't see how many portions of this bill do really anything to to allow for uh, affordable housing other than in this kind of abstract aspirational way. All right, Representative Hango. Thank you. I just want to build a little bit on what um, Jen just mentioned again about how there's no real one solution for multiple communities across the state. And we have gotten a number of new testimonies from various city planners and, and town managers uh, saying exactly that. So one thing I did want to maybe um, embellish on or correct is that yes, a municipality can opt out. However, if they do opt out, there's no guarantee that they would be able to take advantage of any of the monies that are being offered for communities in terms of development. So that's a real concern, especially for rural communities that don't have very much money to work with to begin with, if they were wanting to do some type of development. So I think that's very important for people to understand. I think maybe some of the recommended some of the recommended changes in front of you um, go to that very point. And I think that the language in the bill also says, I mean, again, this is all fine tooth that this is the stuff, this, these are the nuances that we're working through is that they, they would, yes, they would qualify for incentives if they were working to bring their bylaws into compliance. Um, but if they were not working to bring their, um, um, if they're not bringing their um, bylaws into compliance, and yes, the carrots would be lost at that level. Um, I think that's clear. And if I can, if I can just jump in to continue on that vein, I don't know a municipality that that wants to lose that type of opportunity for funding, but I also don't know a municipality who wants to um, participate in that kind of cookie cutter approach. So I really do urge. Um, 
members to look at the suggestions that have made to clarify this and make it a better bill. Thank you. Yeah, and I would and I would also caution us in terms of um, until we actually continue to go through all this stuff to, you know, I don't think this is a cookie cutter bill. I could say that I could just say right off the top that I mean, and, and it may well be. But I just want us to be careful about about drawing conclusions about what this bill is. I mean, there's a lot of laws that fit across the top, just sit. Um, and I think it's important for us to um, keep as we move forward to, um, you know, address what's actually in the bill um, with everything that we're hearing from from the witnesses. And so. Um, without closing off. I don't want to close. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not at a place where I'm going to call this a cookie cutter bill. It may well be, or this section may well be, but, um, but that's what we're, that's what we're working towards um, is an understanding of what that means. Next up is, um, I think uh, Jen, you started to answer the question that I that I had, so I'm not going to ask it. I understand that it's difficult. I mean, VHCB is not a project manager. They're not. Um, they're not the folks that build these um, units. And one of the things that came up last week was the question of um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the um, character of an area as a as a phrase in the statute. And I was wondering if 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 that. And I don't know that you can answer this, but is that what prevented the units to be built in Woodstock? Was that what people brought up against when they fought the Woods? There was a project in Woodstock where there were some 28 units, um, single family homes, I believe. So not multi-unit, but um, single family units that were built. But there was court cases, there were Act 250 um, uh, issues, and it took 10 years to build it. and if I'm not mistaken, character of the area was one of the was one of the phrases that was used to try to um, prevent this development from happening. Does that do you remember that at all? I remember the project and that it was tied up in Act 250 for 10 years, but I don't recall and 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 uh, and there were, I think there were some local zoning implications too. But I, I'm afraid I don't recall if character of the neighborhood was was um, one of the issues there. It often is. Okay, and and I, I don't. Know. Yeah, I can go. Do that and get back to the committee. No, that that's fine. It's I mean it's slightly different because it's those are single family units. And I just want to clarify about the cookie cutter comment that I made. I just want to make clear that there are some communities that have districts that preclude this legislation. So for instance, um, it's entirely possible, and and I still have to have a better understanding of it myself, but there. There's a, there's a real possibility that, for instance, um, water anybody who has a water district or a fire district as the, as the provider of their public water, which happens in smaller communities. Um, uh, I know that Waterbury Village was a race, but now we have a utility district. And that utility district owns the water lines all the way out to where the water comes from. So it goes all the way through Waterbury Center and ends up at the, the Stowe Waterbury Center line. That's four or five miles of, of um, potentially developable land at a quarter acre. Um, we may not be subject to this law because districts can be, um, there are certain fire districts or in our case, utility districts that may be, um, that this may not apply to. And so that's the kind. That's what I want to make clear is that we're we're dealing with a, a whole bunch of different things that we're not used to hearing about. And so um, as we move forward, I think we're going to hear more about where does this actually apply? Does it apply to everybody, um, or does it apply simply to the to, to specific areas? And then identify where those districts are, and then and then really take into account some of their concerns as we move forward. Um, all right, Jen, thank you so much. Um, you're, please feel free to, to hang out here uh, and, and listen in. And um, certainly if you have anything to add, feel free to raise your hand later on. Or if we have a follow-up question, we'll be sure to ask. Um, I wanna bring in um, Maura Collins um, and Sue, I'm doing this simply because last time we had Maura here last week, um, we had to squeeze her in at the very end. And I wanna make sure that um, she gets, <laughs> She testifies today without the pressure of having to uh, 
keep us from um, keep us from our next place. So um, welcome, Maura. Welcome back, and um, and let us know where you stand on on SD thirty seven. Well, thankfully, uh, hi. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the director of Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And um, I hope Representative Stevens, you'll let me know if my internet gets um, problematic. I have yelled upstairs to my children to get off the Wi-Fi, but I don't know if that will be enough. Um, that uh, it, it, I'll be quick. And so Sue will be able to get on soon because uh, when you go after Jen Holler, you often just smile and nod because um, I support what, what Jen has said about this bill. Um, I will say that I'm coming to you today, I'm, I'm in a sort of reflective mood today, and it's because it was 18 years ago today that I moved to Vermont. So I keep thinking about how I've been um, working in the housing world for the past 18 years in this state. And uh, I was new to Vermont when I came here, and um, I it, it has changed in many ways, and in many ways it hasn't. And And I think it was about, and Jen would know the date, but like 12 or 15 years ago, when uh, the state updated chapter 117 and made the revolutionary change that accessory dwelling units, ADUs, were going to be allowed by right. There were certain limitations, which you see in statute, which S-237 is looking to expand a bit because it's been more than a decade and we've seen that we can even go a little farther with that. But I remember somewhat similar conversations from municipalities at that time where the um, housing folks were very excited by the uh, prospect of having ADUs be allowed um, in all communities. Uh, and the municipalities were quite nervous about that change and what it was gonna do and how it was gonna change our communities. And as we can see, um, you know, in many ways, the ADU tool has not been used enough uh, in, in many regards, which is one reason why uh, S237 is going to help make that tool even more um, um, useful to, to homeowners. Um, so VHFA, just to be perfectly clear, supports this bill as it's written. Um, when I testified on this in the Senate, my focus was largely on updating a definition of mixed income housing for Act 250, and that got peeled out into another bill. Um, so I'm actually happy to be able to be on the record in support of the rest of 237. Um, I support the proposed changes because of the potential net benefits on housing affordability of having smarter, more consistent land use practices statewide regarding multi-home buildings and small lots. Um, VHFA was hired to by the state to conduct the 2020 housing needs assessment. And yet again, we were struck by how dire the drop in residential development in Vermont has become. Uh, you know, I, I went back and um, was looking at, at how Vermont's housing has changed over the last 18 to 20 years, and I'm flabbergasted that our housing market has only gotten tighter and more out of reach since um, in the last 18 to 20 years. Representative Byrong and I just spent the last two hours together. Uh, we both were presenters at the Vermont Community Development Association. And he already got to hear me talk about the state's housing needs overall and the reality that roughly over the last 20 years, we've been moving in the wrong direction. Our, on average, incomes have been going up about 2% a year, and yet rental prices statewide have been going up by 4% a year, and homeownership prices have been going up by almost 5% a year. So that means that housing costs are increasing at nearly twice the rate of incomes. So we're losing ground every year. And how we got there is largely because of housing supply. So um, the, uh, Ron has uploaded to um, the uh, committee's webpage uh, a PowerPoint 
that where you could see how the rate of change in housing supply each year. And I, I did commit the cardinal sin of uh, limiting many of you to representing one town, even though I know many of you represent uh, more than one community. And you'll find the same chart for each of your communities where it shows how much the housing uh, stock in your town changed every year in the 80s. And there's a bar for the 90s and for the early 2000s and then 2010 uh, through 2018, which is when the data is from. And you can see statewide that in the 80s, we were adding almost 2% of our housing stock was coming online every year in the 80s. And by the way, that's lower than it was in the 60s and 70s, but still just going back to the 80s. But then that drops in the 90s and it drops again to under 1% a year into the early 2000s. And right now, since 2010, statewide, we're only adding a quarter of 1% of our housing stock every year. We are losing, in many of your communities, you're gonna look at uh, my testimony in your committee uh, website and you're gonna see that your towns every year are losing, you're, you're having fewer homes than more homes. Now, not all of our communities are growing. And so maybe some of this is okay, but what we're losing when we lose housing opportunities is we're losing that ability to be more affordable, more equitable, more welcoming and more available to all the people who we're trying to attract, especially during this pandemic. And so um, this bill, Representative uh, Zott is perfectly correct, of course, that this bill is not going to be the silver bullet that solves all of our housing affordability challenges. And there are things that we could be doing to uh, supplement the tools available in this bill. This is a planning and zoning bill. This is pretty dry stuff, if you ask me. Uh, this is an appropriation, so we're not talking about the money that VHCB so desperately needs. This isn't a finance committee where we can talk about the um, bonding um, that could be possible. This isn't, you know, there's a lot of other tools we can look to, but this will go a very far way, I believe, in helping to ensure that communities um, have uh, opportunities to, um, to use their land as, as well as possible. So when I'm talking about incomes going up 2% a year and housing prices going up by far more than that, um, you know, uh, the supply of housing is not the only reason for that, but the slowdown in housing construction is most certainly due to some barriers posed by the municipal process and regulations and protests from individual neighbors. I believe that the adverse impacts of those barriers on housing prices calls for these statewide policy changes and specifically the ones in section two, uh, providing more predictability and consistency for home builders working across communities is likely to reduce home prices both directly and through increased housing supply. Um, I know I have, I have not read every comment that's come in. It's wonderful that there have been so many written comments. I understand that there have been questions about if these changes will create limitations on municipalities who are already doing this much or more. Um, I also understood the potential for unanticipated consequences. Like I saw the Bennington example where they brought water lines out to the edge of town because of the PCOA concerns. I, I think section two addresses that through the ability to appeal to the state for a substantial municipal constraint. Um, I, I'm open to what the VPA has said about some um, uh, smart resolution and compromise in some of these ways. You know, the VPA, I. I if I weren't doing what I'm doing, I think I should have been a municipal planner because I have so much respect for the planners and they're much smarter than I am. Um, and I really appreciate, because I've worked with them for so long, I appreciate the careful, effective work that professional planners bring to Vermont communities and have brought to those municipalities 
that are lucky enough to hire them. And you've heard from a lot of them in your comments. Um, but I'm probably more focused and concerned about the other towns, the towns um, that don't have professional planners, the ones who are not already pushing the envelope to encourage housing affordability in these ways. So um, the last thing I'll say is that just by having this bill pass the Senate uh, was, um, was reason for it to be written up in some national um, planning publications. It was in strong, I think it's strong towns and, and some other ones. And it's being touted, this bill is being touted as a model for other parts of the country. It's the same way that when I speak at national conferences, I'm often asked about the ADU statute language that's already in statute um, because other states want to copy that. So there's great potential for Vermont to again, lead the way with this legislation. I don't think that this is the last thing you all need to do to answer the state's housing needs, but I do think that um, it'll go a long way and, and therefore I'm in support. I'm happy to answer questions or fade into the YouTube background abyss. I think you're muted, Representative Stevens, if you're speaking. Representative Gonzalez and then uh, Representative Zott. Uh, Maura, thank you so much for your testimony and for putting together um, the comparison for our towns. And so in that, uh, I looked at my town and very surprised to see that our housing stock actually reduced, um, that it doesn't capture the last two years and uh, that we have had some um, sizable multi-unit buildings go up in the past two years, but I just want to say I'm very surprised <laughs> with all the building that we have done in the past 10 years that our housing stock has still gone down. Um, and so that's just something that really stood out for me. And so I well, thank you for doing that very local data sorting for, for us so I could see that. And just thinking about specifically around that, the auxiliary dwelling units that um, we have uh, some small lot sizes in Winooski, but also fairly some um, large lot sizes. And when we do have people that do try to build auxiliary dwelling units, um, and there's actually currently one right now that um, that neighbors are trying to prevent from being built, even though it is well within the current statute um, um, and the municipality water and waste to some being able to handle it. So just that that's really nothing else other than thank you. And I'm thinking about my my local municipality and, and the benefit of the auxiliary dwelling units being expanded in this bill. Yeah, I was surprised pulling those charts together. I um, I'm going to be honest with you that some of your communities surprised me. There were you know virgins. There were some that um, the the charts were going in different directions. And and sometimes you know we can say well maybe there was some outlying years. Maybe the data. Um, doesn't adequately uh, cover. Winooski has done a lot with form-based codes and, and really thoughtful planning and, and growth management. And so um, maybe uh, some of those things aren't captured. I'm never gonna pick one data point and say that this defines a community, but um, I, I wanted to share, it was interesting to me that across the board, most of your communities did see that same kind of declining um, housing growth, or, uh, sorry, declining how of the housing stock that uh, we see statewide. Hey, Representative Sott. Oh, um, can you hear me? I, I, can, I don't see my, uh, my okay. Um, I'm glad to see that you included Barnard um, in your charts. My question though is, is that obviously housing affordability is more than the supply of housing stock, right? Um, also a big picture, a big piece of housing affordability would be rental prices uh, because not everyone has the capital or the desire even to own a home. So the fact that you don't have housing stock isn't necessarily reflective of the overall picture of housing affordability. Am I off? It's one indicator, but it's not all the indicators, right? Okay. Absolutely, okay. but housing stock does include both rental and ownership, just so you know. So the my my real concern with the I was on my planning commission or I still am for the past six years and we're just a bunch of uh, non-professional local yokels. But um, you know even if this law were to pass, uh, there the, the biggest impediment. That, well, there's several impediments to development of housing stock in Barnard. One is second homeowners because we have a proximity to both Killington and Suicide Six ski area. 
So people are from out of state who make much larger, have much larger incomes, buy homes that are in, infinitely affordable to them, but they're not affordable to the people who live in Vermont and make Vermont wages. That's a huge obstacle for us. Two, we couldn't build uh, dense housing in our communities, even if we wanted to, because our soils are such that building any kind of adequate wastewater makes it prohibitively expensive to build dense housing. And the third problem is the proliferation of uh, Airbnb properties that take otherwise perfectly viable rental units out of circulation for families of course, and put them again into wealthy tourists' hands. So we have seen a decline in our rental housing stock that almost matches perfectly with the rise in the availability, availability of Airbnbs. And if this bill were to say, we're gonna strictly regulate Airbnbs to owner occupied dwellings, you know, that's you know. a zoning regulatory change that I think would go much further in the availability of housing stock for working Vermonters than mandating you know, lot sizes. But you know, I'm only speaking from Barnard's perspective, not from, I don't represent South Burlington and I don't represent Winooski, I represent Barnard. Yeah. If I can respond, I think um, you bring up a lot of really good points and, and one that I try to always include every time I open my mouth and I and I didn't this time, so I'm glad you raised it, is um, that when we talk about needing more affordable housing, that doesn't always mean that we have to build new homes, new new a lot of our communities have vacant homes, have poor quality homes, have homes that need to be um, reinvested in and brought back to life and up to code and um, be, be affordable housing by bringing it uh, to be marketed and marketable as well as affordable. So, um, you know, I, I haven't um, done a needs assessment in Barnard, but I, I don't know um, what the housing stock and individual challenges are there, but I, I can tell you that um, sometimes, you know, what what brings those housing stock numbers down is not just that we aren't building enough to keep up with population growth, because we know that many communities do not have population growth. But what we see is that the quality of housing goes down so much that homes come offline, they become uninhabitable, they become um, no longer considered by the census and others a reasonable um, that the, the structure is no longer considered a home. It's now, there's a whole housing destruction rate. So, um, you know, we need to protect that from happening and, and tearing apart some of our communities. The, the Airbnb concerns, um, that was also in the housing needs assessment that we conducted. We did um, a deep dive into uh, what's happening with uh, Airbnbs. So if you haven't looked at our housingdata.org website, you can pull up every town in the state and see uh, data around Airbnb uh, rentals. We limit it to, we only look at, um, it's not just Airbnb, it's also VRBO and HomeAway and a couple others. Um, it's the, the biggest providers. And um, we only report on um, the uh, 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 responses where uh, homes are, the entire unit is available for rent, not just a bedroom, because I kind of don't care about those, and from a housing market perspective. Um, and you can see where we see the most of the um, uh, impact of Airbnbs is near the ski communities. Uh, obviously, Southern Vermont is, is heavily impacted by that. Although we are seeing that in some ways it is in line, you know, Vermont has long been the either number one or number two state in terms of having seasonal homes. Uh, we always compete with Maine for that distinction of who's number one, who's number two. So um, while now um, all the vacation homes are more obvious because we can look at these data sources, looking at Airbnbs and we can go on Airbnb and we can see um, these websites, we also know that um, the reality of Vermont being a vacation home destination has long been a part of our identity and an impact on our housing stock. The question becomes, is it getting worse? And I think with COVID, a lot of us are looking at a lot of indicators to find out what is getting worse and will we see more people coming to Vermont and using homes for um, vacation homes and not being available to year-round Vermonters? Are we seeing more out-of-staters come to the state? 
Uh, I'm as desperate as anyone to get my arms around this data because you know how much I love data, but um, a lot of that just isn't available yet. It's just, we, we need a little more time. So, um, Maura, just in terms of, to, to get back to this kind of, um, there's not enough new housing being built or developed versus housing that's being lost. I mean, it's been pointed out that we're losing housing because of um, short-term rentals. Um, but the other idea is um, building or developing is, uh, primarily a commercial choice. Um, someone has to make a piece of land or develop a piece of land. They have to go through already an existing um, laundry list of permits, um, especially in the denser areas, though this is one of the things that we're trying to do here is to try to make it easier within designated downtowns and designated village areas and neighborhood areas. We've already done work to try to make it easier for people to develop in a, in a dense fashion um, where the services and in the case, I think less important, I think, I think the services are less important to developers than it is the infrastructure that would allow an, a, a building to be built I mean, in their mind, affordable means I can build this, I can then rent this out and pay at the very least my taxes and my mortgage. You know, the, those are things that private developers bring to the table. How, how do you view this in terms of the interplay, not just with what Vermont's stated needs are in terms of the need for more housing, but in terms of what a developer might be needing when they come to try to say, I'm gonna, I wanna come downtown and build eight units here or four units here. Um, can I build it on the small of a lot? Um, yes, it scratches the back of the need for more downtown dense um, things, but that's a decision that's being made in the community anyway. Is that, I, I, I mean, does, this, does that question make any sense at all? Or is this that the idea that, that it takes more than two people to tango here in, in trying to create affordable housing? I don't know if it takes more than two people to tango, but I definitely know that um, it it takes more than just some, um, than reading a municipality's bylaws to understand what's going to be possible. So I have heard from multiple developers, nonprofit affordable, private market rate, and everything in between that, um, a lot of developers look at what is allowed in, but in the zoning or the bylaws or whatever governing document you're looking at. How many units per acre is allowed, and they they can expect to get half of that of whatever's on the books. They um, ideally always try to push for a little more than half, but um, I believe that was one of the concerns that tied up the um, Woodstock affordable housing development for. 10 years in the state Supreme Court and um, was that it was supposed to have allowed for many more units than uh, were ever going to be proposed to be built or that got built. Um, so in many ways, um, you know, we have to go beyond just what's on the books and look at what actually gets done on the ground. I probably told you before, but I teach at UVM on the side and I love academia. Uh, but academia is not reality, you know, and so there is what's on the books and there's what the zoning says, you know, maybe it's a um, one unit per acre, maybe it's one unit per half acre, but that does not mean that if I have two or four acres that I can do the math and figure out how many homes I'm going to actually be able to build because there it's a um, there's a lot more to this process than just this zoning. So by uh, having the zoning rules be flexible and encouraging to increase density, it will only help start the conversation in the right direction. And then from there, we have other considerations like lot setbacks and, um, and well, any number of more factors. So um, I do think that that's some kind of predictability. That's why I mentioned um, 
you know, knowing what some of the, the base standards would be across communities would be helpful to developers who work in more than one town. Um, they, they would know what to expect a little more moving from town to town. Not exactly, but hopefully. All right, question from Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, I'm back on your housingdata.org website and um, there's really nothing showing in my district because it's pretty rural and um, there aren't really any big municipalities. Um, however, I'm a little bit curious about what, what this, I'm looking at the inter, interactive map now, what this interactive map is actually showing us. Is this um, subsidized housing? Is it, um, is it just housing developments? Because it certainly isn't all affordable rental housing vacancies in Vermont. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what it measures. Okay, I think you're, so the main part, so housingdata.org has two main parts and um, most visitors care about our directory of affordable rental housing, about 80% of people, that's where they go. It's only about 20% of nerds like me who go to the community profiles that pulls up the data that I was sharing with you all. Um, I'm guessing that you're looking at a map of the um, directory of affordable rental housing, and that would be mapping out roughly the 13,500 affordable apartments that have some kind of government subsidy in them. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, yeah, you may not see, not every district will be represented. Um, and so it, it may look like there's no affordable housing in that community, although one of my not so funny jokes I like to make is that there's many, there may be 50 ways to leave your lover, but there's many, only three ways to make affordable housing. And um, one of them is by building a structure like uh, Representative Stevens speaks often about French block above Aubuchon and Montpelier or some of those buildings we can go, that's affordable housing. That's one way of having affordable housing. There's also section eight vouchers that are used in um, any number of, um, apartments. Um, I believe Representative Gamash is a landlord who, you know, um, people will live in regular uh, landlord owned apartments, um, but it'll be affordable because of that voucher. And then the third way to make affordable housing is to have really crummy housing and just have it be rented at a really affordable price because there's not a lot of people who want to live there and um, you're limited as to your options. So that map you're looking at is just the first of those three categories. Um, if you go to housingdata.org and scroll maybe a little bit, you'll see a community profiles link and that brings you to more housing data than you're ever gonna wanna know. And um, there's you know a map there that talks about the number of households, but on the left there's, I'm looking this way cause I'm looking at my, my um, I have the website up. You know, you can get information about population, income, home ownership costs, rental housing costs, housing stock, which is where I found that chart that I shared with all of you, uh, housing needs, housing programs, and you click any one of those, like I click housing stock, there's information on the number of housing units, short-term rentals I was just speaking to, the rental vacancy rate, how many vacant homes, the year homes were built, um, the number of bedrooms, uh, home fuels, that's important to look at um, utility costs. And then the rate of change in housing supplies, the chart that I shared with all of you. You can also see information about building permits, broadband access, and the number of days on the market that homes for sale stay on the market because that's an indicator of um, how hot or cool our markets are. Any one of those categories, home ownership costs, rental costs, will bring you to a dozen more charts than for any of those, you can um, then, when you click on the chart and you see it where it says location, there's a little um, search glass, magnifying glass, and that's where you can um, start to type your community's name and pull up your community's information. 
So thanks for explaining that. I guess I'm a little confused as to why when you click on the first one, find rental housing, all you find are subsidized housing or places that are available for Section 8 vouchers. And um, not even all of those. One of my towns has nothing listed. Um, and I'm sure they have something available, but I really do kind of want to take exception to the crummy housing language because um, today on the governor's press conference, there was a, a local reporter who asked a question that was pretty derogatory about one of my towns. So my ire is up, if you want to say, my hackles are up today about that. And we have in Northern Vermont, as I'm sure they do in the Northeast Kingdom as well. We have a lot of really nice places for people to live. They may not have a lot of amenities like transit centers or grocery stores um, or other supportive services, but they're beautiful places to live and they're really affordable and they're not derelict and they're not against code. They're, you know, they're nice places that that nice landlords rent. So I really do kind of take exception to that. And I hope that those types of properties are taken into consideration when somebody's looking at a map for a place to live that's affordable in Vermont. Thank you. I just, I would love if the legislature ever wanted to uh, create a rental housing registry where um, I could list all of the rental housing that was available to rent in the state, then we could add it to this site and we would be able to do what you're speaking about. We could have the affordable ones listed and then we could have all the market rate ones listed. And then we would have that full picture of where the rental housing is in the state. But um, right now we only know about the, affor the government subsidized affordable ones because we finance most of them. We work with our partners to know where these ones are. When you do search for the vacant ones, if you look at vacancies only on the website, there will be, um, you may know of vacancies that are not listed. Sometimes affordable housing has such a long waiting list that those managers don't bother to tell us that they have vacancies because they know that they have 40 people on a list for one apartment vacancy. It's not worth their staff's time to type in, I have a vacancy and get all these phone calls um, when they already know they're gonna have no problem filling it immediately. So we know that that's a drawback of this system. Um, and, uh, but otherwise, I think it's a great idea to um, take the government affordable, the subsidized affordable apartments add to it with some of the market rate. And then we could truly give renters and people moving the state and others a really good picture of what's available and make sure that we can um, keep all the units that we have available occupied. And so we don't have as many vacancies as we may have now because there's not that one repository. So thank you for that. And that was truly a faux pas of mine because I'm not, certainly not suggesting a rental registry that includes private um, places, but I do wish for people in the state to understand that um, there are government subsidized places to live that are affordable, but there are also a lot of private homes and, and apartments that are affordable as well, um, that people just need to look into some of the outlying towns for that. It's not really all about government subsidi subsidization. Subsidization, <laughs> thank you. Sorry for the background noise. There's lawn mowing going on. <laughs> so Maura, um, before we move over to Sue, I just a couple of things that may actually may not be that quick. Um, one of the things I noticed as I was looking at your chart, of course, are the decades that you are taking them apart. Um, and we know that in 2008 with the recession that the construction industry in particular was, hard, was hit hard. And, and truly hasn't, and I think this shows that it truly hasn't recovered to the levels that it was prior. And there could be a hundred different reasons why um, that, I mean, it seems to me like there's been a lot of construction as, as, um, as, as Representative Gonzalez was just saying, there's been a lot of construction in Waterbury in the last, you know, little bit. Um, uh, it don't, it's not that it's not reflected here, but it just shows that there's the larger thing at, at hand. But ha with that, our population has also stagnated. 
yet we have the oldest, we say, we keep saying we have the oldest housing stock. So I guess my, my question is for you as a, as a data nerd, um, like, okay, Probably. so, so you're taking, you're taking the data and you're being nerdy about it, but we're saying, I'm asking, um, how do we interpret that data? I mean, cause we can pick and choose, right? I mean, there's lies and there's damn lies and there's statistics and, you know, and we can, we can pick out of this chart or your website, a hundred different ways of interpreting things that might fit our uh, politics, just for sure, for lack of a, for lack of a word. So I'm just curious to know, you know, from, from, your perspective and so here comes the question so we have um so there's that there's there's also this bill at least the section that that is most controversial in this bill is dealing with the differences between inclusionary zoning and exclusionary zoning and exclusionary zoning to me means that each town can set up bylaws that say for these reasons, you can or cannot build in this area. And the inclusionary language here is saying, well, if you do these things, if you have a bylaw against short-term rentals so that we're not advocating to turn ADUs into, into Airbnbs, if you do these things, then you, you get these benefits because we want, but, but you can't deny someone the opportunity to build in this case, multi-unit housing um, on smaller lots. So I guess my question is, you know, how does this how does this data fit in? The existing data fit into the existing world of exclusionary zoning versus what we're trying to do in this bill. I mean, what's the bone? I mean, what's the benefit for for? I mean, this isn't all about affordable housing. This is about available housing as well yep um that's a big question to answer uh so i'm going to start at the beginning of what you started saying and hopefully i'll get to answering it um uh, that's fair that's how i asked the question so yeah um so er early in your comment um you asked about population stagnation and you know do we really i you didn't ask this specifically but i i heard a whiff of and maybe i just i've heard it before people saying well, do we really need to grow our housing stock if we have population decline? And I just want to um, remind you all that, you know, population is different. The number of people in Vermont is different than the number of households in Vermont. And our population may be steady or slightly declining, uh, but the number of households in Vermont has actually been growing. And the reason that is, is because uh, we are living in smaller and smaller household sizes. Used to be, you know, you'd put, you'd have six, eight people living in one home and that would be a family, maybe because they had multiple children, maybe their grandma and grandpa were there. There are a lot of reasons why we had larger household sizes. I'm an Irish Catholic that, you know, we know about large household sizes, but then as time has gone on, uh, that has gotten smaller and smaller. So when you think about your grown children, uh, let's say, um, well, I'm gonna think of one of you I know, you know, you have three pretty grown children, you lived in one home, let's just say in Waterbury, and now maybe if they all were in Vermont, you would now need four homes, you know, one for each kid and, and one for the parents. Uh, in divorce situations, you have one family home that now becomes two. Um, there are a lot of reasons why our household, we, we have more households and therefore we need more housing in that way. Um, the next one, I, I hate to point it out, but we don't have the oldest housing stock in the country. We have the ninth oldest housing stock in the country. Just want to put that out there. Um, but your, your bigger point um, of inclusionary and exclusionary uh, zoning um, you know, this is attempting to be a step towards being more inclusionary and having that be the default and, and to strip away some of those exclusionary practices. Um, as Representative Hango pointed out, and I think it's so critical that we always go back to this, not all affordable housing has to be government subsidized affordable housing. You know, what we put on the website, 
that's the government stuff and all that. But there is a lot of housing that is affordable because that ratio between incomes and housing prices matches up for people. And the trouble we have is as I started my testimony over the last 20 years, incomes have been going up, but home prices are going up twice as fast. And so we are losing ground in that regard. And um, so there are fewer of those non-government subsidized affordable housing units that are affordable to us because we have more childcare expenses, because transportation is more expensive, utilities are more expensive, taxes are up, as well as healthcare and other things. So um, as we lose ground, we need to double down and work harder to make sure that the housing that we have is affordable. And not all of it, we can't afford for all of our housing to be government subsidized affordable. So we need to do things like what's being done in S237 to make sure that we're adding to the housing stock so that the market rate housing um, can come in at a lower price point. And one way for private for-profit developers to have market rate housing come in at a lower price point is to increase the density that we allow. And so that's what this bill ultimately, one of the biggest things that I hope it will accomplish. As for the data matching up, data is always looking backwards. You can, I mean, you saw my charts. It only goes to 2018. The world has changed in the last six months. I don't have any data to prove that the world has changed. Um, and I'm not gonna have data for a while on that. So we do have to just look at what's happening around us and you know, remain somewhat flexible and, and know that no, none of these charts, no pretty website we can create is ever going to answer all these questions for us. Um, but based on what we see from the past, looking out the rear view mirror, here's where you know, we think as a state we should be going, which is what's in S237. Representative Zott. Representative Zott. Can you hear me now? Is it working? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I I don't know why my computer does that. I, I know it's I know it's disruptive. Sorry. Um, one, one other thing uh, I just wanted to raise with the solutions that you just laid out in your last answer uh, is this idea of government subsidy versus the market. Um, and of course, there are, there are other options. Um, in, in, I would just argue you know, that obviously healthcare, the market has not delivered affordable healthcare to Americans. The market has not delivered affordable housing uh, either. Uh, subsidies are one approach. That's the approach that we've taken with healthcare. It hasn't delivered what we want either. Uh, the government in, could also provide housing. Um, the state could in, institute large scale housing trusts and then achieve some of these goals as well. Uh, we could become the, our own developer uh, as you know, we have some of those models around the state. Um, so again, I see how that would deliver affordable housing I don't see how lot sizes mandated by the state's going to. There are much better tools. We keep calling this an affordable housing bill. In my view, it does very little to accomplish affordable housing. Uh, I think there are very meaningful things we could do. There's meaningful things we have done, like the housing bond. VHCB's work has always done it. This bill just seems like it's terribly misnamed. OK, uh, thank you. Um... All right, with that, um, Maura, thank you. And thank we're going to go up to Sue. And please, if you're, if you, um, if you do black out your screen, just um, if we do call for you, um, we'll, you're more than welcome to stay. Um, and we'll notice, I'll notice anyway when you take off. But um, if you need to, that's fine too. Um, I want to welcome Sue Fillion from Brattleboro. Um, who's here to talk, I think, in part about um, the mobile home development that, we've, that we were just talking about. So welcome to our committee. Um, as you've noticed in the time that you've been here, we will have a, you know, the microphone is yours. And when um, you're done, then we'll do some Q&A. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sue Fillion. I'm the planning director for Brattleboro. Um, I am here primarily to speak um, about TriPark, and then I will probably give you my opinion on a couple of other 
um, sections in the bill. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Tri-Park Housing Cooperative, um, but it is the largest uh, mobile home park cooperative in the state of Vermont. There's about 293 total units um, in three properties. Um, it has about seven, there's anywhere between 700 to 900 people, um, which is actually six to eight percent of Brattleboro's population. And I would also point out that it's larger than a lot of municipalities in the state. Um, and despite that, they don't necessarily have access to what municipalities do for funding sources. Uh, and we'll get to that. Um, TriPark's stated mission is to provide affordable housing to predominantly low and moderate income homeowners. And um, many of their shareholders are elderly or qualify as low income. Um, they also you know, have a lot of, of people who work in the community, um, teachers, firefighters, um, people that work at the hospital. Um, so it's an important source of housing for Brattleboro and it does provide important affordable housing um, as well. Um, they are also located, they have several of their housing units are located in the floodway and the floodplain and um, have had repetitive flooding over the years. Um, Irene was particularly difficult with for them um, they lost many units in that and um, had a lot of recovery to do. Um, and, you know, they, like many mobile home parks in the state, they have infrastructure needs, um, failing infrastructure uh, that's, that they really need to deal with. Um, back in 2008, the town of Brattleboro and Tri Park signed an operating agreement uh, because they needed to in one of the parks, they needed to replace the water and the sewer system. And as a part of that agreement with some pressure from DEC, um, TriPark agreed to develop a master plan to remove homes from the floodway and the floodplain. Um, and it took some time for us to get, for all the partners to get that going. But in 2019, with some funding from um, the community development program, um, we set to work on creating a master plan. Um, that master plan was basically looking to guide the re relocation or removal of the mobile homes from these hazard areas. Um, but it was really important that we, that the conditions of the property be considered, the financial um, situation of the park. Um, and so those were key pieces of it. And basically there's 42 units um, that were, you know, basically that need to be moved. Um, some, there had been a higher number, but some were demolished as a result of Irene. Um, and so they, we've come up with a plan, um, at least a first step of a plan where we think that we can create 25 infill lots in the Mountain Home Park. Um, but at the same time, there will be the loss of some units. And that, um, and then this plan also addresses some of the infrastructure needs that they have. So. In two of the parks, there are um, wastewater and um, sorry, wastewater infrastructure that needs to be updated. There's one bridge that needs to be replaced, another bridge that needs to be rehabilitated, and then there's some stormwater issues that have to be deal with, dealt with, particularly in Mountain Home Park, which uh, by 2031, um, I think I can't remember when the date is, but they'll be subject to a general stormwater permit. So they have significant infrastructure needs that the plan took into account. Um, and then their current financial situation is tenuous at best. They have a very high debt ratio with a lot of capital projects that need to be undertaken. Um, it would improve after 2031 when some of the debt is retired, but they can't really wait on their infrastructure improvements. And really they're just a flood away. You know, Any of the next floods could, um, wipe out more of the housing units and is going to, you know, be really difficult for them to withstand. So um, any project that they are going to need, that they will undertake is going to need to require financing of their refinancing of their loans um, and probably grant assessment, assess, assistance, sorry. Um, and they have been working with various state agencies to kind of figure out where the funding can come from. And I guess as a final note, um, I would just like to say that since its inception, Tri Park has been dealing with social and environmental justice issues head on. 
Um, they purchased the land because the property owner was going to sell it and this important source of affordable housing was going to be lost. Um, there was a lot of political support to form the cooperative. Um, and I think there was a lot of excitement to do that. Um, I'm not quite sure that there was the due diligence on what kind of infrastructure they were inheriting. Um, and you know, so they took it on to preserve their housing. They uh, took on $6 million in debt to bring the water and the sewer systems up to good repair in Mountain Home Park, but in the other two parks, they're still failing. Um, and then, you know, there's the environmental issue of the flooding and low-income housing uh, being in the floodway, which is not uncommon probably throughout Vermont either. Um, so they've done a lot. They continue to work hard to preserve their housing and to make it safe and keep it affordable. Um, but they do need help. So I just really want to um, impress on you to support the, the part of the bill that, that deals with directing DEC to work with them and, and consider options. Um, it's just really important for their community and for the entire community of Brattleboro. Um, so with that, I guess I can, I can take questions on TriPark or if you wanna hear some of my thoughts on the other parts of the bill, I'm happy to share those. Whatever works best for you. The um, I, I know that someone who testified earlier this year about Tripark Park had mentioned the same figures that it represents close to, uh, or almost eight percent of Brattleboro's uh, population, and I think that's um, again gives us the idea that 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 affordable housing is not the same every place, um, and I know that Brattleboro has a substantial. Um, a substantial number of units downtown or in non-flood areas that are that are also um, mm -hmm. that are also affordable. But um, when it comes to the long-term planning, I've heard a lot of dates that go out so far. Mm -hmm. And um, are you worried that that at some point the state will, whether it's because of nature or whether it's because of regulations, that the state will force this park to close down? Or is that what DE, the DEC language is, is for? No, I, I don't, I've never heard a discussion of that, um, of, of wanting to close them down. Um, I think the, the situation is that if they had another flood and they lost more units, they're, they're not going to be able to, it's going to be difficult for them to recover. And um, part of the reason that the town is involved is that, you know, we've, Back to their bonds, and so it's you know there's also debt. For if if they don't make it, then it's the town of Brattleboro that's holding it as well. So it's in everybody's interest to um, keep them viable, but most importantly to provide a safe safe housing for the community. Okay, no, I've, this was the the language regarding the park and DEC was probably one of the least controversial parts of the bill, I think, as far as we were concerned. Um, other questions for Sue before she moves on to different testimony? No? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, just really briefly, I wanted to um, support some of the expanding of the, the tax, cre tax credits, both in the neighborhood development areas and then also for flood proofing. Um, we know we have Brattle, uh, buildings in downtown Brattleboro, historic buildings in the floodplain, um, where the flood insurance rates are just going through the roof um, because they've had the shift to the actuarial, actuarial rates. Um, and so like the Latches Theater is one of those buildings. Um, and so anything that can help with the investment in flood proofing these buildings, I think will help preserve the building values. Um, and it's just really important. Um, and then I wanted to say that um, there's been a lot of discussion about the inclusive zoning provisions today. Um, I feel like some of them were written based on Brattleboro. Um, our accessory dwelling units are what is exactly what is proposed in the language. It's been like that for some time. Um, our minimum lot size through uh, most of the town um, water and sewer areas is 6,000 square feet. So just slightly larger than the eighth of an acre that is being discussed in the legislation. Um, 
and yet still we have an affordable housing crisis. Um, and so I, I don't feel like the minimum lot size is the key in Brattleboro. I share the concerns that some of the other towns have mentioned, some of the other planners have mentioned about this one size fits all approach. Um, actually tonight in Brattleboro, our select board is considering an interim zoning bylaw um, where we're proposing that we get rid of the density caps because I feel like that is the area that is kind of restricting some housing development, at least in the regulatory realm. Um, you know, I think there's lots of variables, um, construction costs and um, just the market. I mean, in Brattleboro, our most successful housing projects have been the ones that have been undertaken by Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. Um, we've had, you know, most of the subdivisions that we had in our town since the 1980s, all except one that I can think of, have pretty much gone bankrupt. So we just have such a low development pressure for um, building larger uh, developments. Um, and unless there's some sort of financing subsidy that's going on, like Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust can take advantage of, it's really difficult to build it. So. I'm not sure that the minimum lot size is the best approach. I do think that DHCD's Enabling Better Places zoning guide is very insightful. Um, our regulations were audited through that. Um, and so some of the proposals, changes, proposed changes that we're bringing to the select board tonight are come from that. And so I think letting that be out there, having the RPCs and other consultants and town staff work with towns to kind of look at their regulations and, and figure it out, I think is, could be important to let that happen first. Um, and then even with our 6,000 square foot lots, I would say, you know, we do have areas of town that where the water and the sewer extends past those areas. And I am just a little bit concerned. Sometimes the roads are in great shape or, um, you know, they were extended for various reasons, such as the Vermont Welcome Center in Guilford, you know, we extended our lines down to, to help make that project happen. So I think that there are other costs to municipal services to consider. Um, so I think the suggestions that you'll hear from VPA and maybe some of the other planners, I think that there are probably tweaks that can be made to, to help improve that. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming up um, in a manner of speaking. Um, so it's 426 and Ron, were we scheduled to be here till five or 430? Five. Um, I, schedule, I scheduled us till five. The, uh, the, the calendar has us till 430, but there's not, there's no conflict. So I just, given the number of witnesses, I just alerted yeah. people that it could run longer. No, that's fine. Um, so, um, Ellen, are you still with us? Yes, she is. Um, I know I had one question from Representative Byron to, to get to the, I think is he has a question specifically about this. I guess it's about the cookie cutter part of this or it's about the lot size. Um, so Matt, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, no, thank, thank you, uh, um, Chair Stevens. Um, so my question is is around that section with the one eighth lot, one eighth lot size. Um, my um, municipality, my primary development area is obviously for Jens. And so the question is, is, you know, would any parcel hooked up to city water have the ability to be subdivided to a one eighth acre lot? And and sort of the, the mindset, because we're in the middle of, um, redoing high density, low density, medium density designations right now. And they see that as making sense in the historic and high density area, but they have concerns about the medium and low density areas because of how they also abut other areas. So essentially the question is like, would a one acre lot be able to be subdivided just sort of as a benchmark standard into eight, one eighth parcels and sort of like, you know, you could drop like a townhouse or carriage house kind of concept on each one eight acre parcel. Does that make sense, the question? Uh, it does. Um, and I don't know. I would need to, I need to think about it a little bit. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, 
Um, because as the language is phrased, uh, so no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting the creation of residential lots. So I don't know. I can look into it. Yeah, yeah but there's a lot of development interest in this area. So we're just trying to understand how this would have the impact here. I mean, we have a very, very hot real estate market, very, very, very low rental inventory. And where we're at right now is just trying to understand, does this make it an applied standard that a one acre lot could be obligated to be subdivided one eighth, one eighth, one eighth, bang, 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 unit, unit, unit. So as we're designing our, our long range plan, that's something that keeps popping up. Yeah, I wonder, and I just would wonder out loud too, just about whatever existing zoning exists or, or requirements. I mean, we, we talk about parking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the parking plan for, and you know, essentially putting 32 people on an acre is what you're talking about, right? You're talking about eight units of, of you know, 32 units. Um, where would you find parking for 30 cars um, at the same time? So, I mean, this is where the, this is where things, the interplay comes in, but I under, but I totally appreciate the, the theory of like, is it possible to just yeah. plug it in that way? And it's like, does one acre become like a, a, you know, a four level unit of like apartment style condos, but the way it reads is on this one eighth lot, like you're looking at like bang unit, bang unit, bang unit, bang unit. And then it just, the, the, the square footage on the properties just starts to get a little tight. Right. I guess it depends on what's available. What's, what is it now with, with your water and sewer? I mean, I, I'll use an, another example from, from Waterbury. There's, there's a series of apartment buildings across the street from Shaw's uh, right out as you get off the exit. And um, when they were being developed, when they were being, the, the plan was going to be that they were not on, they were not on water and sewer. Mm -hmm. And so the zoning for them, the act 250 zoning for them was, well, if you build a nine unit building, you don't need an Act 250 permit, you know, no matter what the water sources are. In that case, it would have been um, whatever water plus if they, have, if they had septic fields and not, didn't use the town water and sewer, the village water and sewer. Well, the sale of the property was contingent on them being annexed into the village and using the water and sewer so that they could, so that they could bring that so they didn't have to deal with septic. And it was only revealed later that and we only discovered this later in our thinking was that we went from allowing 36 units of four, four buildings of nine each that didn't have to have Act 250 permits to, to having um, the density because they became part of the village of having over 100 units, you know, because of the water and sewer. So I guess it depends on anybody's local, what, what, what is your village, what is your village zoning when it's on water and sewer already? versus um, and what's acceptable throughout the existing bylaws versus what this is proposing. But I totally appreciate, you know, I think, I think your planner wants to, I mean, when you have language the way that Ellen just read it, it is, you can't deny me the right to subdivide this. And I think clarity on that probably needs to be. Yeah, and, and we're in the process of, of redoing all this right now and pulling the last like parcels that are currently agricultural, which basically aren't being used right now into medium and you know different densities so what we're looking at right now as we are literally in the process of doing this is how does this language impact the plan we're looking at there right because they, they seem to be like intersecting points that are currently being rewritten and we don't know how they're going to inter interplay with one another okay yeah and i mean are they part of i mean are you designated downtown is that going to be is that going to be an adjacent neighborhood area uh you well, know that, lots of questions you know and then we're getting into the nda component with our designated downtown and how that you know becomes more expansive so yeah there's a there's a lot of of nuance popping up with this within my uh my planners and, and also our regional planner our county regional planner so yep uh representative hango 
Thank you. So I want to thank Matt for bringing that up because that's a really interesting point and I'll be interested in hearing the, the clarity on that. I just want to comment that, that that conversation probably won't really be taking place in, in most of my towns just because of um, how rural we are. And even though a few of them have their own municipal water and sewer systems, um, I can't I can't even fathom, you know, that that road with one acre lots of townhouses going up. So that I guess goes back to my point that this shouldn't be a cookie cutter approach. It should be it should allow various municipalities to have a say in what's best for their own area. And um, I think Sorry, this bill is written, I think, at, in section two, just does not allow for that. Um, so again, I think we really need to take a look at section two. Thank you. Representative Trina. Thank you. Um, I did notice um, uh, uh, actually the highest number of, or, or highest percentage of decrease in housing stock um, in Hardwick, one of my towns, I was kind of surprised about that more. Um, you know, uh, Jim Levinsky and Memorial Housing Partnership have been uh, working uh, pretty hard uh, in town um, and adding units every year. There's another fellow that's, uh, uh, you know, added units to the downtown. But one of the reasons I've been so quiet here <laughs> is that I, I live in a town that has uh, no multiple family dwellings, has two acre zoning in the village, four acres in outside the village and 25 acre zoning on uh, in rural. Um, you have no water and sewer. Um, so it's a little difficult for me to relate to some of this stuff. So um, I've been quiet. Um, I couldn't imagine my town um, dealing with some of these issues uh, at all. Uh, so, um, you know, I just kind of keep quiet, but I was curious about the decrease in Hardwick um, uh, housing stock. I thought we had been making some inroads there. Is that a question for Mora or just sort of a? Just sort of a comment. Okay. On my quietness. <laughs> Unusual as it may be. <laughs> Um, but do you have any uh, co comment on that, uh, Maura, as to Hardwick and, and any of that? Okay, that's cool. I really don't. I, it does go back to don't forget that housing destruction rate. It's not just all about construction, but there is destruction, and sometimes units do come offline. I don't know if that's the case in Hardwick. I'd have to drill down further. Um, but, you know, we, it, I know that after the last recession, it, uh, there was a lot of talk about um, the surprise at how much housing construction was happening. And in, in some ways, I, I read some good articles that were talking about, you know, perception being reality and how we went for so long. It took so long to come out of the last recession that for so long we were not used to seeing construction and capital wasn't flowing and the, there was a credit crunch. And so it took so long for uh, construction companies to get raise the capital that they needed to um, undertake big projects that um, by the time capital really started flowing again um, we all weren't used to there, there was some pent-up demand that then is spilled over and we probably saw um, a decade's worth of construction kind of compressed into five years in some ways and so it, it seemed like a lot but we had uh, forgotten what it was like that, that we hadn't seen enough construction for, um, you know, during late 08 through maybe, well, then there was Irene in 11. So I just mean there was a, um, some of the construction that was happening was just making up for um, problems of Irene and things like that. And we really weren't adding until um, well into the, what do we call the 2010 decade? And, and I wonder, again, how much of that, too, is, you know, the difficulty in developing um, housing that for a commercial developer, again, uh, it's expensive 
um, there's no question that when starter homes in in Chittenden County are being can't be built for less than three and a quarter um, or can't be you know it, that just points out um, how difficult it is for for um, one one of the witnesses who was not able to appear today Eric Hoekstra I saw him at a at a at a conference five years ago talking about how difficult it is and 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 to build affordable housing and what the numbers were and if he had subsidies in Burlington has Burlington has more um, opportunities to uh, more regulation and when it comes to building and what credits he could he could qualify for but nevertheless it was a pretty high number that he still had to charge for rent just to you know that was not in the conventional way that an affordable housing organization can build it um, with the, with the way that their funding is done so um, and so high-end homes you know got got built i think or at least that was a perception is that the, the first the next blush of rush the next blush of construction was for higher end homes and not so much for um what we've been developing the 120 up to the 120 of ami um, which has been part of our conversation so all right i uh, I, I was reflecting on having lived here for 18 years but it, you know, so much of my background is not Vermont based and I'm just so much more used to speculative building where, you know, you just you you build developments, you single family homes, multiple, and then you sell them, you know, in, in some phases, but you just you build and then you sell now. I mean, in Vermont, that would be way too risky. The land use laws here. I mean, it's too expensive. So the only people who can build are those either with means who can get a custom built home or affordable you know government subsidized housing is a form of it because they can put up 30 unit apartment building and then fill it and because it's subsidized you know that market is really there um but you know when it comes to the homeownership market we just don't see a lot of development and and some of that is really good we don't want to see speculative building in our countrysides um uh, you know, negatively impacting. We 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 have smart growth and and it's worked well in our state, and yet there is this. We we do things differently here, and that may impact our prices in that way. Well, and we saw. I mean, when you do conventional, you're talking about how data looks backwards, and um, you know, downstreet housing when they were developing the 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 French Block and then the Taylor Street. I mean, that was a substantial number of new units. And a substantial number of affordable units for set for a particular price range, and I know that the project development folks were very concerned about flooding, quote unquote, flooding the market because based on old, based on the looking backwards, adding forty plus units in a two year period was 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 asking for vacancies. But as it turns out, all of those units rented almost immediately because the need is so great and you know there's a waiting list for for them and and that price point again without subsidy is still um it's still pretty high so um i mean stuff costs money to build and i get it to the point of why people would want to build more multiple unit places um to spread the cost representative howard trying to unfair um, thank you. I, I wanted to say thank you to Maura for her chart, but um, being from Rutland County, <laughs> um, I was sad to see that uh, as of uh, 2018, we were in the minus, but I would like to say that now we are headed in a better direction. So I'm, you know, grateful for that, but um, thank you. Thank you.